Sharon Leslie Morgan, genealogist and author, is the founder of Our Black Ancestry, an online community dedicated to providing resources for African American genealogical research. In 2019, she received the James Dent Walker Award from the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, the highest honor given to genealogists in her specialty. Sharon has not only devoted her life to genealogy, but has also actively fought racism head on, as detailed in her book, Gather at the Table, co-written with Thomas DeWolf, who is a descendant of one of the largest slave-owning families in United States history. Through her research and writing, Sharon has helped countless individuals pave a path toward family discovery. And now, Sharon Leslie Morgan. There is a visceral connection to the land where I found the plantation and I can go out and I can walk on that land. That means a lot to me. But I can look out over a cotton field and I can see my ancestors bent over, picking this cotton in the hot sun, walking in someone else's footsteps, walking in footsteps that belong to you, that belong to me. Just when you got to that black prairie land, you could smell it. It was just different. Siete diferente. Y es muy bueno saber que estás de regreso en casa. My ancestors came from here and fled. For me to come back and reclaim memories, experiences, relationships, I think that that is going to help with healing from the historical harm of slavery. family history that happened here in Mississippi 150 years ago. So she was very cautious when she was coming down here to, to learn more about her own family history and to do the research here. It affected people who were enslaved in one way. It affected the people who were the enslavers in another way. These were incredibly abusive relationships because you're doing something that is so antithetical to human values, that damages your spirit, it damages your soul. You know, our community's changed a lot over time. We all know each other, we know each other's families, we are just a nice, tight community, and take care of each other. I came to write a book about what I found here. It's almost like a movie script. It needs to be a movie, in fact. My two times great-grandmother. Her name is Betty Wharf Gavin. She was taken from her mother at the age of nine. She had her first child when she was 17. The father was the nephew of the man who owned her. So Robert Lewis Gavin was the father of her child. And then she proceeded to have 16 more children for a total of 17 with that same man. She's become a valuable part of our community. Well, this is the Knoxville County Courthouse deed room. And it may not look like it, but this is a treasure trove of material. And no matter what, every time I come, I find something that is astonishing. When you're doing African-American genealogical research, one of the large problems is getting to 1870 and not finding any records prior to that because we were not documented as human beings, but rather as property. So, in this room, you will find books that record transactions where land has been transacted and maybe slaves were thrown in as part of the bargain. What is great about this courthouse is that the county was established in 1833 and the records go back to then. So, it is like an uninterrupted, 
stream of material. I used to spend a lot of time here when I was a teenager doing genealogical research. Because of the Gavin Wills and the state, the state inventories, I have been able to track all of the people that they own more than 25 year period. He bequeathed more than 100 people to his eight sons and I can track them for 25 years. What happened to those people? And the estate settlements have actually given me their names. It's just extraordinary to me that Sharon's been able to piece together all of this, these records to form her family history. This is a big one for me. This giant. Slaves are usually listed after the furniture and the household implements and the domestic animals. But when you find it, there have been days when they hit, I, <laughs> the clerk comes running, it's like, are you okay? <laughs> so I'm like, oh, hallelujah, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. And remember I said how important it is to say their names, to honor them. Phoebe Seaborn. It is a personal ritual because these are people who didn't have a voice. William, David, they can't speak for themselves. Catherine, Margaret, so they couldn't say their own names. They couldn't say their own lives. They couldn't share their stories. So that's my way of being able to encapsulate their humanity and give, to give them a voice. But Sharon, it's so good to see you this morning. Um, hopefully the weather, it looks like it's beautiful there in Mississippi. It's beautiful here in Utah. How, how, how is it this morning out there? It's beautiful. It's sunny. It's warm. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's nice. Now tell me, tell me exactly where you're coming from. Where, where are you in Mississippi? At this moment, I am in Knoxville County. Macon, Mississippi, where I moved two and a half years ago in order to research my family who came from here. And so I grew up in Chicago. Right. And I've lived all over the world. So to come back here to this little town, which has 2,200 people, was kind of amazing but it has been an amazing experience to engage with my local community. Well, I'm so grateful that you're part of this Roots Tech Connect virtual experience this year. I've known you for a couple of years now, and really, uh, ever since I've known you, I've known that you've had an incredible story. Um, you know, one that has inspired me and has kept me on the journey, but one that really I think lots of people need to hear. And so that's why we, we have you here. So to get us started, can you kind of tell us how finding your ancestors became such an important part of your life? Like, for example, I know you, you've mentioned in the previous interview, and, and I know you have a son, that, that having your son kind of sparked you on this family history journey. Tell, tell me more about your, your journey, or just a little bit about your journey. So... My journey started when my son was born in 1969. And when you produce a life that you know God has given you, it makes you think about life in the big capital letter life. Mm -hmm. uh, because you want to know where you came from and where you are going. So that was kind of the first thing. So then in 1974, Roots came out and it intrigued me because it gave us a picture of how African-American people, uh, the history, our history, mm -hmm. And then off and on through the years, I have either researched intensively or because I lived all over the world, not been able to do that. The internet has made it possible for us to have incredible information. Family search is like uh, amazing because it lets you 
get documents that never would have been possible before. So it started as a little seed when my son was born. It grew into a sapling tree when roots came out and it grew exponentially because of what family search can do. Wow. Well, on your journey, you've uncovered a lot about your ancestors. I've read, you know, several things that, that you've written in your book, Gather at the Table, the book you wrote with Tom DeWolf about kind of your journey for healing. And you mentioned several ancestors. Is there any one particular ancestor that, that you have a memorable story about? Or, or could you say you have a favorite ancestral story? I can't say there's a favorite, but I can say that as an adult, I realized, because my father told me, that my great-grandmother had been enslaved. And I connected that back to when I was a three-year-old child visiting her house. And she, did, she, did, she didn't talk, and I couldn't talk because I'm three. <laughs> and it was very profound later because it's like, wow. He said she was enslaved, her husband was enslaved, and here's a story about what happened to her. And that really uh, was a revelation because the realization was that in my own lifetime, and I'm still a living person, Please, I hope so. That slavery existed, slavery, the evidence of slavery existed within my lifetime. And that was really profound for me because people think it is so far gone and it's not. It is in the lifetimes of some people who are living today. So that really made an impact. And so... I got root, I got my baby born, I got roots, and then I get this information about my great great grandmother. And then I started researching her life. And I found a huge amount of information since then. But that is the journey that I have been on, and it has been incredibly meaningful to me. So that's here wonderful. I am. That, that- that's, but I like what you said. Y- you have personal evidence of the effects of slavery because you had a connection, even at three years old, that you remember to this day of interaction with somebody in your family who was enslaved. That that's powerful. I, I've not had that experience. Many of us, you know, slavery is kind of distant from us, but for you, it's kind of front and center. And a lot of your research has taken you right. I mean, you're in the heart of the Confederacy right now, right? Um, and and where slavery, you know, really had a stronghold in America. How was it emotionally understanding that you've had enslaved ancestors, and how how have you how have you processed that? Okay, so emotionally, many people have a feeling of shame because our ancestors were enslaved. I never had that feeling. I always felt like these were incredible people who survived incredible challenges and managed to do incredible things. So my enslaved grandcestress, who picked cotton and had a very bad family has- history, ended up with somebody like me, who has been able to do some really successful and interesting and wonderful things like being involved with Family Search. Uh, so that evolution is amazing. So one of the things that I say 
about my website, ourblackancestry.com, is that they were the dreamers and we are the dream. So when they were picking cotton, they had they dreamed of something else. And we are the product of that dream so that we can go forward and we have to honor that and we have to appreciate that and we have to look back and we have to say their names. So that's where it ended up for me. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Um, part, part of this discovery of, of your enslaved ancestors. So well, just actually give me, give me some more details on how this whole thing with you and Tom DeWolf came together. You have this book out at the table and, and, it, and it's based on kind of this experiment. And I love how you and Tom go kind of back and forth with your story. Can you, can you share how that whole experiment developed and how you and Tom came, came to be? <laughs> okay, so in my constant quest to find resources for doing research, I came across something called Coming to the Table. And they were doing an event at Eastern Mennonite University. And I reached out and I said, wow, this looks really interesting. And then the person who was responsible for it said, well, you should come because we're having this workshop. And so when I researched into it, it's like Eastern Mennonite University with these people that I have no idea who they are in this place where I have no idea what's going on. And it is like, you do not want to walk up into a white people trap and be frustrated or in danger. She convinced me to come to this event. And that is where I met Tom DeWolf. And it evolved into, we're talking about the program was about historical harm. So we're talking about the historical harm of slavery. So how do you get over that? And Tom and I ended up saying, hmm, this is really interesting. The model that they had presented to us about how you deal with it was very intriguing. So he said, okay, you're a writer, I'm a writer. We were both unemployed and we're looking for, okay, this is like really looks interesting. What can we do here? And we decided to write a book. And so part of this book is, is documenting your travels together, right? And, and the various experiences you have as you, well, wh why is it called gather at the table? Well, what's the meaning behind that phrase? All right, so the first point was coming to the table, which brought us together. Mm -hmm. And then we're saying, okay, once you come to the table, you need to really gather and get this information more deeply. So we decided to test this model and go on the road and we drove among other things, we drove 6,000 miles in 30 days. <clears throat> and we went to places that were significant to our personal genealogies. So Tom's genealogy starts in Rhode Island, which many people are like, Rhode Island? What does that have to do with slavery? But the DeWolf family were the largest slave traders in American history. And then we went to small places, like where my ancestors came from, in Lowndes County, Alabama, and in Knoxville County, Mississippi. And we tried to make this connection between how does this all work? And we ended up with gather at the table because you can't just come, you gotta gather, you gotta stick. You mm -hmm. gotta stay. You gotta not give up when things are bad. Mm -hmm. So, what was everything rosy on this whole journey you were with with Tom? Did y'all have any no. fights? And 
Uh, I know the answer to that already. I uh, mean, uh, reading the book, you, uh, you guys have some tense moments, right? In, in, in your experiment as you're going from place to place. Tense um, is an understatement. Can, can, can there were moments it? when I wanted to kill him. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know that he ever felt that about me. Uh -huh. But there were moments that were so awful because we would, the idea was, let's take our genealogy and let's go to these places that are the source of where we came from and let us think about black person, white person, and how do you feel about what you're seeing? Mm -hmm. So we would go to places and his opinion was so opposite of mine because he's a white, he's picture perfect white guy. And so there were many times when it was extremely difficult because I could not understand how you, Tom, don't understand. And there were times when we cried, when we, when he had to just let me go, there was a time in Lowndes County, Alabama, when it was like, get out of my car, because I'm. if I had a gun, I would shoot you. So it was incredibly uh, difficult, but we made a promise at the beginning. We were going to do this, we are going to open our minds and we are going to put aside all those things that we've been taught. And we are going to have an honest, open, truthful relationship, mm -hmm. no matter how hard it might be. So that's how we got through. But it was really difficult. Mm -hmm. So you Tom did not end up on the side of the road in Lowndes County, Alabama. He's still here with us today. He is still here with us today, and he's <laughs> my very special friend. So, so tell me that that journey. So, you, you, here you are in Lyons County, Alabama, and you're ready to, to, you know, it's it's about to come to blows. I'm ready to throw down. <laughs> but, but you, but you get through. Like, what, what kind? Of, can you kind of think about maybe some principles or or maybe some something you did that that turned the tide that led to this fact that, that you because I mean the, the book is about healing, the healing that came as part of this powerful journey. What was it that led to this healing? What was it that you did that kind of changed the way things went? I guess the first thing was entering the relationship with a desire to heal. It was counterproductive for me to think that I could go and meet these people at Eastern Mennonite University and people who want to heal, who want, who want to heal from the legacy of, enslaved, of slavery and to actually enter that space uh, as much trepidation and fear as I might have had to actually go there. But the goal was historical harm happened and what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And to Im be open enough to that idea. And as it unfolded, engaging the process that we were taught there about confronting the legacy and act truthfully and actually dealing with it. So it evolved over time and it ended up with Tom and I are the only example of the people in that group who actually acted it out so other people don't have to. Mm. Uh, but it was amazing that as counterintuitive as it might have been to engage someone that you do not like, whose history is abhorrent, that you can 
by doing that, it actually gave us another level where that is actually how you heal. Here's a white guy Mm -hmm. who really wants to do something, make amends, address this. Mm -hmm. And that's what it takes. So what I hear you saying, and you correct me here, is that you were intentional in going in into it. You eyes wide up like the whole purpose is to heal. And so you were you were willing kind of any means necessary and do the hard work, the uncomfortable work, the the painful work in order to get to that place. Is that yes, it is is intentional. You Mm -hmm. must decide. I'm going to get off of the wheel. It's like this wheel that is rolling is the historical what we have inherited. And there is a moment when you have to say, no. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to hate white people. I'm not going to uh, do things that are the same as what happened in our past. I'm going to make something different. So I'm changing the paradigm. And that's what we did with our book. And that is what I am doing with what I do with genealogy. Thank you for doing the hard work. You said you you and Tom kind of lived through this example so that others wouldn't have to. They could learn from, from what you did. And that's that's kind of what you put in the, the book. I want to explore this term that I love. It's called purposeful reconciliation. Yes. Can you explain, can you define what that is and what that means and how it played a role in, in your experiment with Tom? Okay, well, first I'm going to say reconciliation, reconciliation implies that people were reconciled at one point. So we're not reconciling because it's never been reconciled. We are trying to make a new position, which is we have to address our history, look at it truthfully and think about how we can make a better America by consiling, by, okay, now let's be friends. Mm -hmm. We weren't friends before. It was awful before, okay? Mm -hmm. So now we have a chance to consile, to come together, to be in unity, to embrace human compassion, to embrace whatever your religious orientation is, the principles of human compassion and human understanding. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think we are. Mm -hmm. So so much goodness there, right? Um, Thank you again. Now, how how has genealogy, the, the, the pursuit of your own ancestors, kind of led to this healing, right? What, what is it about genealogy that, that and, and digging into your past and your family that can provide healing? Or can it? So my family story is that my two times great-grandmother was enslaved. As a nine-year-old child, she was transported to Mississippi. She ended up having 17 children with the nephew of her owner. And that is the story that I'm pursuing as I live here in Mississippi. So it is, you can either say, okay, well, maybe there was love like Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Hemings. But I don't think so because women didn't have choices then. And reconciling that, consiling that Mm -hmm. is a big deal for me because as I pursue my research, I am trying to give voice, humanity to the people that I am researching. Many genealogists just want to know the name, date, place. That is much more than that. 
It is uncovering the humanity of the person. You want to see in your head, at least, because there were no photographs before 1850s, that you can see them, but you can see them in your head and you can see what happened in their lives and, you know, what was important and who they were. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. Mm -hmm. uh, undoubtedly, you, you, as you want to reveal the story and the humanity, right? And that, that's what, and, and of your own family, and that kind of helps you gain a sense of your identity and, and start to heal. You can from, from that legacy of, of slavery, which I love how you define in, in the book. But undoubtedly, you found some things that may have been unsavory, let's just say, about your own family, right, in, in the course of this. And maybe there was darkness. And maybe there was some pain associated with doing this research and doing this work. What advice do you have for someone who uncovers maybe painful things in their family's past that they may be able to withstand the journey and, and, and eventually find that healing or, or find the answers they're looking for? When we look at history, we have to realize that people did things that are abhorrent to us now because we're a more evolved society. When you look back at slavery, you kind of have to think that people who were enslavers came from a society largely Scots Irish, who had horrible things happen to them. Therefore, they did horrible things to the people that they enslaved. And I cannot judge that because that was their past. We can only walk forward to the future. But one thing that we have to remember about the course of human relationship is that hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. Write that down. Mm -hmm. So Scots Irish were hurt. There was so much historical stuff happening at that time that it was incredible. And they did what was done to them. And there's a really good book about that called White Cargo. So you have to look at why that happened. And you also have to look at the consequences of it because people who do awful things have awful things happen to them. In history, there was an incredible amount of drug abuse, alcohol abuse uh, that affected people who were slaveholders. So they, I believe in their hearts, if they believed in God, they knew what they were doing was wrong. And they, the consequence of that was that they, they suffered. They did, they treated black people inhumanely. And in return, they suffered uh, largely from being drug addicts and alcoholics. So, you know, it's like you have to kind of put these things in perspective. You cannot make it a so judgmental that you don't understand what went on. Mm -hmm. And I don't exactly know how to put these in the right words. But the point is that the historical harm is that it harmed everyone, mm -hmm. black, white, enslaver, enslaved. Mm -hmm. And that is what we have to get through. Mm -hmm. When we see things that are happening today mm -hmm. where slavery helped to uh, make a foundation for white supremacy being the law of the land. That is what we have to get through because no human being is supreme over another. All human beings are equal. All human beings deserve respect. 
and deserve. I would never want to live in a country where there is no diversity because that's what makes people interesting. So we have to respect that always. Histor getting over the historical harm will enable us to do that. Wow. Wow. You broke it down for us right there. <laughs> I did. I, I think you. I think you did. I. I. I that. Uh, uh, you know. I, I understand. And and one of the things that I've learned as well is, it's hard in in you know our twenty first century eyes, to be able to review what happened in you know the seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth century, right? Because it was a different context. And you talked about hurt hurt people hurt people. And so there was a perpetuation based on this institution of slavery. But, but if we realize that everyone was hurting, everyone was suffering, even those who enslaved others were hurting as well, and realize the humanity and the suffering that we all go through, then we, then we have better acceptance, I think, of people. And that was people. a hard thing for me to get through in my evolution which we wrote about in Gather at the Table, mm -hmm. to actually have a day when it's like, wow, white people got hurt too. Mm -hmm. You know, as I'm looking up at these statues in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm like, whoa, okay, it's really hard for me to say, because I'm an angry Black person, that there was damage on the other side. And I think maybe that's one of the missing links that we have to find is that everyone was damaged. Everyone was damaged. Native American extermination. Everyone was damaged. Sure. Sure. And to accept that, and that's part of the truth of looking back on our history that will help us get forward to the future. Okay, so you... you You've made this point, and I, and I appreciate you kind of em emphasizing it. But I want to bring it in today. You know, obviously, you, you kind of touched on some of the issues of race that are going on today and the discussions that are happening, particularly here in the United States, over race. And, and there's, you know, people who, I guess, struggle. How, how, do I, how do I make a difference today? How do I end this legacy of historical trauma? right, in my own sphere, black, white, whatever. Do you have any advice for them, Sharon, about what people can do today that might make a difference, that might consile, if you will, and bring about a better humanity and healing for ourselves and ourselves as a collective nation and, and, and humanity? If you look at the big picture, it is unmanageable. You cannot get your arms around it because it's so big. So what Tom and I came down to at the end of our book was that change happens incrementally. So if you, Tom, and me, Sharon, and you, Michael, and you know all the people on this call, if we do things in our individual lives to embrace understanding, compassion, and change, that is like a little seed that can grow. And if another other, if, if, other, if more other people do that, that is how the change is going to happen. So I can look at Tom on Facebook when he's camping with his kids and doing these, you know, lovely things. And that kind of unites with the things I'm doing in Mississippi mm -hmm. to change the Knoxville County Historical Society. Mm -hmm. And if Michael, you do something and Kara, you do something and then it adds up. And that's the only way that I know I cannot have a universal answer to this. I am not God. I do not have the answer. <laughs> but I can say from my personal experience that one plus one plus one plus one 
it can equal something. And that is what I am looking forward to because I believe heartily that there are so many good people who want to live a good life and who want to not have these issues. And I have to hold on to that hope in order to keep going. Well, you are one who, with another one, has made uh, just, I don't know, such an impact for millions. I truly believe gather at the table and the work that you and Tom did on healing and, and, and tackling this issue of historical trauma based on slavery and issues of race and did it in a raw, uncut you know, way, I think is, is the catalyst that you're saying will help change the world, right? It's, it's not, it's, you don't have a collective answer, but it starts with the one. One of the things I like in your book, and, and it's right at the end, and it, and it just hit me, I want to share this. Um, our journey would not have had the same impact had we not traveled together, struggled and laughed and argued together. Together. In the graves, the courthouses, the museums, the places embodying both horror and hope, together. Together. was empowering. It brought history alive into the present. We answered the call of our ancestors, confirming to ourselves how much they wanted us to find them so they could help us along. I I love that. (laughs) And and thank you for that. And and that's true, because if you really believe that life does not end when you die physically, Life goes on. There is another form of life out there. And if you truly believe that, you know that they are watching. You know that they are looking at what you do. You know that you can reunite with them in the afterworld. And that is really important because we have to do this work in order to make that uh, that, uh, reunification possible. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Sharon, thank you for your words today. Um, thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you for, for being a part of this, this experiment we're calling Roots Tech Connect and, and this yeah. virtual <laughs> keynote. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, again, I, I, I can't say enough on behalf of the Roots Tech team, on behalf of us at Family Search. We honor the work that you've done. We're so grateful that you've shared your time and your story with us. And we pray and hope that it will inspire others to to go on their own journey to gather at the table. Thanks. 